um, in the first few minutes, I guess, as we um, just get settled in here, start thinking about your course, or a course. Think about the target courses you are want to focus on. Probably if you're moving to Canvas, you're going to move more than one course to Canvas, right? Um, just start with one in mind today. Think about what, who are your students, what motivates them, put that down there. Then think about the course goals. Oftentimes we have course goals based on what we want to cover in the 16 weeks, 14 weeks. But think about how can I open up that space for students as well. Think about the evidence that you need. What are the assessments going to look like? And then what are the activities? And we're going to revisit this as we go through today. And then finally, one of the things that I'll refer to a lot today, and that is um, represented a lot in the content, in the worksheets, is the Canvas community. And you can get to the Canvas community in your Canvas course if you go down to help, and then ask the community. <coughs> the reason I want that I push the community is because there are like 30,000 people on it who use Canvas as instructors who want to do stuff. Now these are not just the Canvas um, employees saying, here's how to do this. There's a lot of the how-to button pushing stuff on this Canvas community site as well, or links to guides that Canvas has out. Have any of you used the Canvas guides yet? What do you think? I see a lot of this and some of this. Um, one of the things that I like about the Canvas guides is Canvas puts out videos and they put out um, text documents with sort of the bullet points on how to do stuff, screenshots and things like that. So if you like to learn by watching video, hitting pause, trying it yourself, you can learn that way. And if you like to learn by following along step by step direction, you can do it that way as well. So Canvas has multiple means of representation covered there. So it's kind of neat because if you ask a question there, chances are really, really, really good that someone will respond to you. They are not necessarily good that you will get the answer that you want. For example, why does the Canvas Google integration work so terribly? Um, well, it was designed that way. Can it be fixed? Eh, no, not really. We'll vote on it maybe someday. <coughs> um, but still, it's good to go there, and then five people will be like, yeah, that's a good question, and so you feel affirmed that way at least. <laughs> All right, that's my introductory comments. Um, if you read the description, you will have seen that the um, goal today is not, this is not a button pushing how to press this button, go to this page, how to set up this page, how to do this sort of stuff. We'll cover a little bit of that, but primarily this is how to, how to use Canvas well, how to use it pedagogically um, in ways that learning sciences, cognitive psychology, um, curriculum instruction, schools and research <coughs> have looked at and said, this is how students learn well. That's part of it. The other part of it is, I know that you are all busy and teaching may not be your primary task. Sometimes, for many people on campus, teaching is a secondary thing. So one of the goals that I have in my work here is to help people do stuff faster, easier, better. Right? To make life teaching more streamlined, more interesting, more fun for you as well. So I try to keep that in mind. I will not introduce a tool that is super, super complicated. Um, or if I do, I'll say, this is super complicated. You might steer away from it unless you're really passionate about it. So that's our, our big thing. Um, think about the students in your class, who they are, things like that, right? We are motivated by the product problems that we find interesting. There's all kinds of research on intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. Some of you might be familiar with this, but the basic idea is money is nice, rewards are nice, but one of the things that will motivate us the most is our own internal motivations. How many of you have hobbies? How many of you get paid to do your hobby? All right, this is a double win. How many of you, regardless of whether you get paid or not, 
spend an inordinate amount of time, energy, money working on your hobbies. <laughs> Why? Why do we do that? Because it's fun. We're hooked on it. Sometimes our hobbies are not fun. Sometimes our hobbies are a pain in the butt. They're hard work and they're expensive and we can sometimes absolutely hate them, but man, we are hooked. We are engaged in them. What's so, an example of a hobby that's hated? I'm just curious. Well, all right, maybe not hated, but there are times probably when you hate your hobby. Like there, I don't know, I, I like to bike sometimes, but there are times that I'm like, oh, oh what I would do for a recliner right now, right? <laughs> For the right, right. <laughs> all, okay. all right. So that's actually a great example. The training of it, things of things, right? That can be a real. I used to study video games and learning, right? And people would be like, "Oh, video games are fun," but there are parts of video games that are not fun because you got to do the same thing over and over and over again to get to the next level. I hate doing the same thing over and over and over again, but I want to get to the next level, so I'll do it. Can we do this in school? Can we do this in our classrooms? Can we get our students to do the things in our fields that we love? Our, we love our fields. But can we get them to do those things that we hate in our fields just so that they can get to the next level? Nothing to think about. Um, and we're different, right? Our students are different. Think about the colleagues in your department. Same department as you, same area of study, right? Basically. but. If you look at the person who you are in the office right next to your office, they probably have it tremendously different. They're like a whole different person, whole different set of motivations, whole different areas of expertise. Their path to get to your very narrow department, think about like really in the population of the world, you guys are all like this, but they are so different. And our students, even though they are all in our same 400 level class, 100 level class, whatever, vastly different but we oftentimes treat them exactly the same. So my question is, and the challenge, how do we hook a variety of students that we teach with the content that we teach to make life better for them and to make life better for us? And this is what I've come up with. And I've stolen this from James Paul G, who studies video games and learning. Um, and he looks at good learning principles in video games, but it's not just about video games, it's about the good learning principles. And I figure that if we can do this in video games, we can do this in our classrooms, especially our electronic online classrooms. More and more. Our learners solve good problems, and the good is based on what they feel is good, so that they can reveal the systems. If we can reveal the systems of our field, it's like the puzzle pieces start falling in place, and all of a sudden, like, we start to become fluent in that problem space. So we're going to try to learn how to design our course in Canvas to do that. <coughs> there is a framework that we can use to do this. Universal Design for Learning. Have any of you heard of Universal Design for Learning? All right, great. Universal Design comes out of the idea of disability um, access, right? So people in wheelchairs get to a curb and it's really hard for them to get up the curb because they're in this vehicle that doesn't do curbs very well, right? So we make out those curb cuts at the corners. Now, just by making out the curb cuts in the corners, it's not just helping the people in wheelchairs, right? Who else does it help? Uh, ladies with strollers or parents with strollers? Stroll, yes, yeah, so they don't have to do the, the pivot lift thing, right? Anyone else? Bikes, unless you're wanting to jump. Bicyclists, yep, exactly. Especially if you got the skinny tires, you don't want to jump with those, right? Older individuals can have some mobility problems. Yeah. yeah. Either the older individuals who mo have mobility problems or the ones who are walking like this, right? Who are younger. Who are <laughs> and no younger mobility older. problems. Still have <laughs> cognitive mobility problems because their focus is elsewhere, right? So just a simple curb cut can help all of these people. This is the universal part of the universal design. It's designed maybe for one group, or starts off for one group, and it turns into something that's generally really useful. Elevators. Any of you take elevators, even though you might not need to? I do. Um, think about buildings would not be taller than five 
six stories if we did not have elevators, right? It just would not be practical. But this thing that helps the people who can't go upstairs well helps us get up to the 10th, 12th, 100th floor. And it does this in, in the, the what of learning, the how of learning, and the why of learning. And it does this through multiple means. Multiple means of representation, of action and expression, and of engagement. So we're going to think about that in the back of our mind as we're going through um, this empowering learners aspect. <coughs> Why is this good for students? Well, same reason that our hobbies are good for us. We develop personal relationships with the content, we connect the content with different, many different aspects of our lives, it becomes part of our identity. Um, we're more resilient. That same drive that gets us um, when we're training for a Berkebein or, or whatever, it helps us get through the difficult times of our content. We're more engaged. We produce more interesting work because it's not just work for the instructor that does not connect it to my life, but I found a way to connect it with my life, and that means that it's interesting to me. It brings unique perspectives. It inspires others, and we start having something to talk to friends about. So how about for the instructor? How many of you have taught students that were clearly not interested in what you taught? A lot of fun? Is it like, that's the worst part of teaching, I think. It's like you just look at a room and they're all like, the playoffs up, up yet, you know, what's good, you know. <coughs> they ask better questions, they're more engaged in class. They write papers that are more interesting. And you've probably all read papers by somebody who's passionate about something and somebody who was just making sure that they had the 12 point font and the right number of words and that they covered all of the points that were in the checklist of things to cover. They give better evaluations because they're more engaged. Because it's boring being in a class if you're not engaged. They bring perspectives that help you see content in a new light. Have any of you learned from students? Were the students really bored and disengaged, or were they the ones that, I mean, we can learn from bored, disengaged students, right? We're like, oh, I should probably up my teaching a little bit. But the ones that teach us stuff about our subject are the ones that are engaged in that. They can inspire us. They can share enthusiasm with their friends and families and legislators. Um, first, they'll admire us, and that's nice. Um, and then they're more positive and resilient when dealing with your mistakes, because you're all human, I'm human. This course is today is going to have all kinds of problems, but hopefully you'll overlook those because you're engaged in the content. Um, I mentioned to some of you before uh, you came in that they just revamped the Wisconsin experience language. And I'm generally not the shill for university <coughs> initiatives, but they have words here, phrases that are actually targetable now. And it's kind of a neat a neat way to, to think about our teaching. Are we doing things that help our students increase empathy and humility, relentless curiosity, intellectual confidence, purposeful action? Um, the multiple means of representation of universal design, universal design helps us do a lot of these things. It helps us reach more people. Um, universal design is a tool to help us with inclusive teaching with implicit bias. Um, if we are usually teaching from a single perspective, that is probably biased by our own learning, and we're missing out on perspectives of some of the people in our classroom. Having multiple means of representation, multiple means of engagement, letting the students make the connections and bring connections that are interesting for them into the classroom helps us with the empathy and humility it gives them intellectual confidence if we can let them take charge of the, the learning. If they take charge of the learning, it also frees some of the work for you. So you don't have to come up with all of these different perspectives. Enable your students, empower your students. And then purposeful action, more problem-based learning, project-based learning. All right, you're all familiar with Legos, right? I think Legos are a great metaphor for this. If I gave you a bunch of Legos and I said, I want you to learn how to use Legos, 
does it matter whether I assign you all to build a house, or a car, or a dinosaur, or whatever it is that you want, right? If you're interested in, what are you interested in? Cars. Cars. Jeff can build a car. Will, what are you interested in? Boats. Boat. Jeff, uh, boat, Will can build boats and he'll learn about Legos. Anna? Birds. Birds. Anna can build all kinds of Lego birds, right? And by building the birds, you're going to learn the systems of Legos, right? You are empowered to build whatever thing you want in Legos. So the structure is the same. This is a, a fairly easy thing to do. But oftentimes, we go into our Lego curriculum and we'll be like, Unit 1, building houses. Unit 2, putting windows on houses. And you know the bird lovers are going to be like, this is boring. When are we going to get to the birdhouses? I guess you can do that. All right, so there are a couple of points of co-designing. I'm sorry, of empowering learners. And you can follow along at this point. Um, just ignore this graphic. We're going to come to that in just a little bit. But under Empower Learners, if you're the type who likes to follow along, you can do that here. Um, I have an alignment with the Wisconsin experience, and I have an alignment, uh, a bunch of things that we can, how, how to do this in Canvas as well. But there are five points in under co-design. And I'm sorry, under Empowering Learners. But the big thing is empowering learners. Like, you just fig you could probably figure out a lot of these on your own. Can you let them co-design a class? How do you let the student voice come out in the class so that they feel like this is not just a class that they are taking, but this is their class? They are helping to design this class. They are helping to make this. This is, this is their class. This is their content. They can take this and say, I want to be a bird boat driver. I can follow my path and build boats and birds and cars and make my own path there. And that's going to be different from the path of the person sitting next to them. Can we let them all co-design a class? Customize. Can we let them customize that? Um, there are many ways up the, up the path of the mountain of knowledge, right? Can we let them walk fast or slow, um, take breaks when they need to take breaks? Because sometimes, like we want to encourage them to get up from the top of the mountain, but if we push them too hard, they're not gonna they're gonna quit, they're gonna drop out, right? So how do we respect each of our individual needs? Because an emergency came up Tuesday morning, so I'm gonna be late for class. That happens to everybody. It's not just the special needs students or the people with a McBurney disability um, passport. Um, everybody has things that happen in their lives. Can we build that into a class to accommodate all kinds of things to, so that they can follow that in the way that they need to? Identity. Is there room in your course for everybody to say, I belong here? Can you show multiple perspectives? Can you challenge your students to bring in the different perspectives of people that they feel an affinity towards? who have been in your field, who are doing similar work? Can you highlight the out-of-box thinkers who have changed your field? Because there are some students in your class who are like, I just don't get this. Oh, maybe I'm taking it from a different perspective. They'll, get, they'll figure it out eventually. They'll get on that main path. But by telling them they belong, even if they don't quite get it or if they're thinking about it in a different way, is a very useful thing. And then manipulation. Can we give them the tools to actually start playing around with things and, and authentic tools that you use in your, in your courses? Don't just show them how to do stuff. Let them try it and experiment, it for, experiment for themselves. So this is Empowered Learners. And what I'd like to do right now, um, there's a spot in your sheet, I think on the, the bottom of page, I want you to think about your courses right now because you already do this. You already empower learners in different ways. So just take a few minutes and write down some of the things in your teaching practice that you already do. Some of the projects that you have. 
And maybe it's as simple as, oh, I let them choose the topic of their final paper. That counts. You're doing it already. Good. That's a start. So which of your following, which of your teaching practices and student learning activities already empower learners to some extent? Let's take about three minutes and do that. All right, what's on your list? What do you do? Not enough. Ah, come on. Oh, that's all right. Um, here's the other thing about today, um, or my thoughts on learning to teach better. Don't try to do everything. Add one new thing. Add two new things. Just, you know, small steps. Don't, if you do too much and it fails, then you, you lost everything. If you do one little thing or three little things and they fail, no big deal. Part of the learning experience. So I create a student advisory council for a large active learning mm -hmm. class. And students um, meet with me to help us co create a really conducive um, community of learners within a large space. How, how do they, like, what kinds of things do they do? So, um, any concerns that students have about readings, workloads, they bring it to a council member, and the council members make the thing they need. Decide how should we approach the top, the issue, what would be reasonable for right. students for their learning, um, why is this a good project versus a different project. So they kind of help set the pace for what we're doing in the course. So the power of the nursing has student representatives come to represent their problems, and so they have an outlook outlet for feedback. And then you make changes, and they see that the changes have been made. And by bringing feedback and seeing that there's changes made, they feel like, oh, they do listen. Cool. These are really easy changes. Yeah, <laughs> oftentimes. <laughs> really easy stuff. I mean, that's it? That's what you want? OK. <laughs> you can do that. Not hard stuff. Yeah, and then you feel successful, yeah, too. They, like, oh. they love it. So it really a difference. Awesome. Others? Uh, we do, in the Nelson Institute, we have uh, capstone courses for our uh, upperclassmen. Yep. And um, so those are designed to uh, encourage students to explore and display their cumulative skills that they have acquired through the major. Um, for the last few years, I've taught uh, community-based capstones mm -hmm. where we have a community partner. Um, and so the project-based learning fits this model really well of these that you're um, presenting to us. Yep. Uh, one challenge that I found um, in the co-design um, process, learning process with my, with my environmental studies students is with these projects that they are completing for their community partners, um, the students, I expect the students to design their projects. Mm -hmm. And what I've noticed, one of the challenges with my students, the high achievers um, have a lot of trouble with creative thinking. They want me to tell them what to do. And so I had a group this last year, or excuse me, this last spring for the, we participated in the university, C-I-T-Y, partnership with the city of Monona. Uh, my students were, as a group, high achievers. Um, they really struggled with, you need to figure it out, and you have to work with your community partners and, and figure out how to do this project, given these basic guidelines. Um, and so uh, through the semester, a lot of the instruction was sort of encouraging them to go through drafting processes and do problem solving because they, in their other courses, they hadn't done that and they didn't have the confidence. And they really wanted me to tell them what to do. And they were really frustrated that I wasn't. So how many of you have something similar to this in your upper level courses, right? Yeah. At our upper level courses, this is when students start to feel like, oh, I, my identity is already set, right? I have declared a major. This is part of my of who I am. I am a Nelson Institute person. Um, I'm a physicist, I'm a whatever, I'm going to do this sort of thing. At that point, it's kind of like, it's almost too late, as you said, right? Because they're already enculturated into the way that we do things here, right? They've already swallowed the Kool-Aid. 
Um, how come we don't do this at our lower levels? Because they're large classes. Because they're large classes. Yeah. It's really difficult to do that with that, right? Yeah. So then we get them when they're seniors, we have 20, right. and they used to be 400 and tall. But right, right, exactly. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of the, so. So today we're going to look at ways that we can start <coughs> to introduce this. Because everybody who comes into your 100 level class is unique. They have maybe all gone, maybe they could have all gone to the exact same high school in the exact same class and all graduated at the very top of their class. They are all unique because they all have these different experiences, they have different family life. One of their fathers is a, a, is a business person, another one's a real estate, the mother's a lawyer, the father is you know, the aunt is a doctor. They have all of these experiences, all of these expectations about what their life is going to be because they know how to draw or they are really good at writing or they can do math like nobody's business or they're the person who can fix the lawnmower. They all have unique experiences that they can bring in. How can you open up your course space so that they can bring in those unique experiences into your field, into your area of study? Let's look at how to empower learners. And we're not actually going to look at how to empower learners other than through these things right here. Um, I think I do have a, a couple of things that we can look at. Yep, let's do this. Empowered learners get a say in what and how they learn stuff. All right, so you all have access to our course here. And what does the course look like? The course looks like, if you haven't seen it already, let's check on our dashboard. And then I've set it up. It looks something like this. Yours will look different, right? You guys don't see any of this stuff, right? All right. I don't know what that looks like. I've never seen that. I, well, in student view, it still has that because it lets me think. Get back into settings. Oh, okay. I, I guess I'm just imagining that. Um, I might be imagining that. So you have a little bit more space for this yeah. access. <laughs> All right, excellent. Um, I think many of you took this Google form survey. I'll be honest, I have not. I'm a bad instructor. I've not looked at the results yet. Sorry. Um, we should look at that. I'll look at that thing right. Um, today's activity sheet is a Google Doc embedded below. I have both embedded in the page so that they can see it, but for some people that's awkward. So I will also add a link to it. Um, I encourage you to make a copy of it. So if you click on that link, then you can go to, um, I think I have it right here. Go to file in that document and then make a copy. And then you'll have your own copy. You can add in your own information, type in notes directly into it. Um, it's kind of a fun way to do that. And you can make add all of this stuff in that kind of all right, so our first example is, oh, an assignment, you all have an assignment, awesome. So here's your, have any of you not had a Canvas assignment yet? This will be exciting for you. Yay, all right. So you all get to take the, the assignment. Click on that assignment link, and you'll see that there's a rubric there, and I'll do it with you. Let's see if I can do it. I'm gonna do it as test student. Click on student view. Oh, it does go away. Click on assignment. We're all doing this if we can. All right, here's some information about what we're doing in the course design. Yeah. Here's a link to a 30 hour discussion about how this other universities have 30 hour mandatory sessions. You guys are here for this two hour session. You are not being forced to come back 28 more hours. But you can if you'd like. All right, refine my learning objectives. All right, I want to do that. My assignment, to better understand, I want to connect my reasons for coming, most rules of engagement, with one of the workshop's existing objectives. So the objectives is, uh, you also design, refine course objectives. All right, how do I do that? I'm going to get a little rubric here. Awesome. Well, let's do it. Send the assignment. Are we supposed to see the text box? 
Yes. You if you click on assignment. submit assignment on the very top, oh. there's a big red button. Oh. Nope. Oh. Again, even though there is a student view, it's not always the same okay. for what instructors see and what actual students see. So, and it's even harder because I'm a self account admin, so I can't even I can't be added to somebody else's class as a student. I still have I still see everything. It's a burden. All right, so then I could go in, and I know you guys aren't all done yet, but that's all right. I can go in as an instructor, and I can go in and click on Speed Grader, and I can see. Is this Steve's? Yes. Is that all right if I show this? Yeah. Okay. Because I'm doing it. Um, I, can, I can do the rubric here, and I can make it a little bigger here. And I can say, was this person connection thought out? Set up the uh, Sure. Just click on that. That part's done. Oh. Click on, oh, we didn't do the whiteboard. whiteboard we didn't part. do the whiteboard yet. Yeah, let's do the whiteboard. Uh, what was I going to do with the whiteboard? You guys want to do the whiteboard? Uh, yeah. All right. Very good. So the other part of the assignment was to write your thing on the whiteboard. We have one, two, three, four, five six, seven, eight, nine whiteboards. So 33 people roughly. Three so I'll show you guys a little bit more about this um, speed grader. Um, I have there, the fact that, how many of you have used fact, uh, Canvas already? Thoughts on the speed grader from you guys rather than me. You don't like the speed grader? I haven't used it. Oh, you haven't used it. You should use it. I like it. Like it's also it's a great because for multiple drafts, I actually have my TA help me out in terms of moving through and I try to really complete criteria. Sometimes you can like 10 different kind of list fields to kind of break things down. And sometimes it's not even about a point difference. It's just about an idea or a comment. Are you talking about speed grading or rubrics? Sorry, rubrics and speed grading. Okay. Okay, yeah. The one thing I wish I could do though Understanding, like oftentimes there's that one person in class who we know is a troublemaker, and we <laughs> know that when her name comes up, we're like, oh, not Jesse again, I'm not whoever that person is again. Jesse. <laughs> um, and sometimes we want to protect ourselves from that, so we can hide those names, and then we can just we can still probably recognize the writing, but you know, it's one more step to sort of be a little bit less biased. Um, when I grade this stuff, I can save the grades, so I've just assigned the grades. Um, I might want to be able to say, uh, I've got choices for five points, three points, one point. I can also say, I want to give this person two, two and a half points. That totally lets me do that. I can save that. Set it as complete. Um, I can add comments to it. This is great. Um, I can do stuff like add a video comment. This is really great assignment. Well done. Right. <laughs> there. Actually, <laughs> All right, so there it is that. And I can add more comments to it. I can have a whole conversation with them. Okay. When they see this, they can, they can comment back. 
And you can have this conversation with them. So instead of them coming to your office and saying, what about those two points that I didn't get, that I should have gotten, or that I should have gotten another half point on this part, you can have that conversation here with your glass of wine rather than <laughs> in the office where you have to keep a straight face. Mm -hmm. So uh, question real quick. Um, yes. The assignment, so, so for a comment like that, when you're posting that, it's just the student that submitted the assignment that's seeing that. Yes. Right. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I have another question. I noticed that students um, upload a Word document rather than use the text box. Yes. You get a way to um, revise in their document. Yes. You know, Crocodile. Documents and stuff like that. Is there a way to do that when students use the text box feature? I to put comments and suggestions right in their own text? I don't think you can do the crocodile with text doc. Um, so what they're talking about is Canvas has integrated a, a program that lets you sort of just like annotate PDFs. Have you ever used Mendeley or something to annotate PDFs? It lets you do that. So whether it's a Word doc or a, do they let you do it with images? There's a whole bunch of formats that they let you highlight individual pieces of it, add comments, draw pictures on it. Um, that can be really useful information if your students know to look for it. Um, because you can get in and say this word right here and highlight that word. Or if they submit a drawing or a math equation, you can actually go in and change, make those changes and specify what parts of it. Duncan. Let's do a peer assessment. Yes, I believe they can for peer, awesome. peer review. Yeah. So peer review, we're not uh, really talking about it here, but you can assign grade assignments and make it a, I'm not even going to show you, but I'll show you. You can create an assignment where you have them do stuff. Choose the different types um, and require peer reviews. Uh, yeah, there's when it's due. when it's available. And then what it's due. Um, Excuse me, can we see the instructor view here too? Or not? Yes, uh, you cannot right now because I can choose to add you as students where you get to submit the assignment to feel like, see what it's like for your students. Um, so I'm hoping that I can be, you, I'll be your puppet. You tell me what to do here and <laughs> we, can, we can go through this way. You can have it automatically submit peer reviews or you can have it manually submit peer reviews. Um, you can have the peer reviews anonymous. And I think that for instructors and somebody who's used it, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, as an instructor, you will, it's not anonymous to you. So if Dan fills out Steve's thing and writes all kinds of nasty stuff on Steve's paper. I'll know that it's Dan. Steve won't know that it's Dan, oh, okay. but I will. For due dates, when you've got um, peer reviews that are going to be happening, um, how do you how do you deal with the um, the due date versus when things need to be re uh, the date of when you need a review, and yep. et cetera? All right, this is a, a perfect, perfect question um, for the Active Teaching Lab. In fact, it was asked in John Zimbrunnen's Active Teaching Lab, which is linked um, on your, act, your worksheet there, wherever it says peer review um, with the little canvas icon. That's the one to John Zimbrunnen. He talks about group discussions and peer review. Um, and there will be a link to that. He's got a, he talks about that. There are all these questions, and I wish that I'd be able to answer all of these questions, and I do in our 30-hour session. <laughs> but in a two-hour session, it would be impossible. So mm -hmm. I've tried to give as many resources on um, in that respect. Yes, Peter. What's the difference between manually and automatically assigning? 
So automatically, we'll, um, you can say, I want five people, or 54 people, I want five people to review each one. Uh, so you'll have, you will then have a chance to see five other people's things and give your input on how well five of your peers did on that review. And how do you specify who, who reviews? Well, that's where the automatic versus manual comes in. If I do it manually, how do I do it manually? I don't remember how to do it manually. Um, but, but for the automatic, will it, if you have a class of 50 students, will this go ahead and ping, if you want three reviews per assignment? Yep. It, it will grab three students randomly and automatically assign the whole class. To yes. If you have any students who have not turned it in by the due date, it'll do this exactly at the due time, or one minute after the due time. If you have a student who's a minute late, they will not be included either in the peer review or the reviewing of their peers. So that is a potential shortcoming of this option. And we talk more about that in John's and Brian's uh, active teaching lab as well. <coughs> All right, I have to move away from this because We've got a lot to talk about. Let's take a break, um, and you can keep on asking me questions, but um, you can take a break, get up, move around, walk around as well. All right, welcome back. So we've empowered learners, and we just figured out uh, there's another question. How do you have your course objectives include the students? One way to do a course objective is to say, I want my students to understand X, Y, and Z. Another way to say that is, I want my students to connect the concepts X, Y, and Z with their lives, with some aspect of their life. That would be a more open way of, of doing this. You as the instructor bring course concept X, Y, and Z to the table. The students bring their lives to the table. They have to connect it to their lives. By connecting it to their lives, they're going to understand it in a way that is more personally meaningful than if they just understand and memorize what the concepts X, Y, and Z are. All right, and that's actually about the power learners. All right, so we did this personal outcome thing. All right, let's look at solving good problems. So good problems, what you consider a good problem might be totally different, just as your hobby might be totally different from somebody else's, just as your area, your little special, specific area of expertise is so specialized and, it, and you think it's fascinating, and other people, their eyes glaze over when you talk about it on and on and on at parties, right? Sometimes. Other times you've figured out how to do it in a way that's very exciting. Because um, what is a good problem for me is different from you, is different from all of our students. So how do we help our students get to these good problems? And what do, we, what do they do once they're in those good problems? Here's a couple of ways of doing this. Sandboxes. Everybody remember being a kid, playing in sandbox? What was awesome about sandbox? You build stuff up, Changes. stuff falls down, no big deal, nobody dies, nice soft, you know. It's a very low stakes environment. It encourages exploration. Um, it's temporary in many ways. Sandboxes are great learning spaces. Sandboxes are not real world things. The university is not a real world thing. It's important that students have real world experiences. And you can say to them, you know, in the real world, this would not be acceptable. And it's important that they learn that when they become juniors and seniors and farther on into their specialty, right? First semester freshman, uh, come on, give them a break. They are not real world people yet. Um, <laughs> and they don't know enough about your course subject to be held to the same standards. So give them these sandboxes to play in. All right, well ordered. Novice learners don't know enough about a topic to be able to understand the systems. They don't know how to order the systems themselves. They don't know how to order problems. They don't know the difference between an easy problem and a hard problem. Or how, what, how this easy problem and this easy problem and this easy problem 
if you can figure these out, will help you solve this harder problem. These are things that you need to help them with. And that's the scaffolding idea. Giving them the easy things that lead to more difficult things. They get that figured out, they move to the more difficult thing, they get that figured out. Pretty soon, they're way off the ground doing stuff that they never thought they'd be able to do. Help them scaffold problems, give them well-ordered problems. The idea of fish tanks. Um, if you want to learn the ecosystem of the Mississippi River, and you go to the Mississippi River, it's a very real thing. But it's very complicated, because you've got millions of different species interacting with each other, and it's all overwhelming. If you give them a fish tank, and you put in one species and another species, they can see that connection. They can see that interaction. They can study this. Now you add in another species. It gets more complicated. Add in another species. It gets more complicated, right? This is the idea of the fish tank. Start with simple problem spaces, add complexity. Once they get the expertise with the simple stuff. Very closely related to Sam Oxus and well other problems, right? On-demand and just-in-time learning. Boy, we do this a lot at, in traditional education. We will have students learn all kinds of stuff because someday they may need to do, they may need to learn this. It's kind of like how many of you have navigation systems in your car, use GPS, Google Maps. It's like looking at a map beforehand, memorizing the map, and then getting tested on the map at the, you know, at the end of the, the trip without or, or the test is use what you learned in the map and go take this road trip. On demand means that I need to find a gas station. Uh, find the next gas station. You've got two gas stations up here. It's the signs along the side of the road is on demand. It's just in time. Exit half a mile ahead. It's information when we need it. When we put our assignments together, when we put our courses together, when we design our courses, do we give them a huge information dump or do we give them the information that they need to solve the problems that are in front of them and not overwhelm them with all of the other information about the course at one point? Can you step them through the course so that they only need, only get the knowledge that they need to solve the task at hand? This helps simplify the space for them. And a more simple space is an easier path to follow. Eventually, we want them to follow those really complex paths, right? We want them, so this is a learning space, and it's going to get more complicated. So at the beginning, can you do this a lot? And later on, as they develop these skills, less and less and less. Skills as strategies. I talked a little bit about this with the easy problem, easy problem, easy problem, complex problem. By using the easy problems and exploring those spaces, exploring the problem spaces of the easy problems, they get to understand the systems, which will be the next thing we talk about. And then they can get to the harder problems. And cycles of expertise. Cycles of expertise is the training for the Berkebeiner. That's the, that's the area where it's often not fun. That's the drill. That's the relentless quizzing. I love the term relentless quizzing. Um, Greg Moses in, he used it in engineering. He has a quiz all the time, but they're low stakes quizzes. So if the students fail at them, it's five points or three points or whatever. But every day they come in, they're expected to learn something. They're expected to have, to have prepared for this. So it holds the students accountable, but in a low stakes fashion. Because it's low stakes, if they have an emergency that comes up, I can, I can lose five points and I'm not going to die. Versus the two, semest two tests a semester, where if I get sick on the day of the midterm, I'm screwed, right? So the low stakes testing gets me on it all the time. In that <coughs> article that I shared, the what works and what doesn't work, matching versus spacing is a two terms that are used. Massing is where I learn all kinds of stuff about one thing, and that's done, and then I learn all kinds of stuff about another thing, and then that's done, and then week three we learn all about this third thing. <coughs> it's 
not effective because we learn it and we forget about it. Our, it's in our short-term memory and then it's gone. Spacing or distributed learning is the cycles of expertise. It's the cumulative testing, cumulative quizzing. So the quiz on week seven might have a question from week one because it reminds them of, oh yeah, that was part of this. Or the quiz in week seven requires, in order to answer the first one, they have to think about what they learned in week one, what they learned in week two, etc. It's cumulative, it's distributed over time. That is exceptionally effective for learning. Pleasantly frustrating is another fun um, one. <laughs> Have you ever heard of the term in the zone? Yeah. Where you're just in the zone. What happens in that zone? It's good. It's uh, good. Yeah. I was going to say the amount of challenge is in alignment with the skills of the student or the perceived skills of the student. Yeah. There's this little space here. If you think of a a graph going up. And everything below this line is boring. <laughs> it's not challenging, right? It's like, I know how to do this. This is not, it's not pleasantly frustrating. Everything above this line is overwhelming. I can't do this yet. I don't have the skills. I don't know how to do this. Ah. My mind is exploding because I just am too frustrated. I don't belong here. I need to drop this class. I'm not ready yet. I'm too stupid for college. That's the part, and that's a dangerous spot because it's just, if we just made it a little bit easier, it'd be okay. It's very, very hard to do this, even for one person. For 400 people, you can't do it yourself. You've got to make the challenge really uh, overwhelming, have them do it for a while until it gets boring, give them a new challenge that's overwhelming or almost overwhelming, have them do it until it gets boring, and so on. How do we do this? How do you as an instructor do this? <coughs> Somebody's got ideas, I know. you're in a class of 130 people, <coughs> guess who can? The other students can. If you empower the other students to be teachers for each other, some of your students are at this level, some of them are at this level. Well, the people who are at this level, they think that they might have it, but they're not quite sure. If they explain to this person what they're thinking, they're going to be like, this person's going to give them feedback like, I, that doesn't seem right, or I still don't get it. All right, I think about it in a different way. And I, I think about it and I critically figure out how to explain it to the next person. That helps. That is powerful learning. That is the paraphrasing that in the what works and what doesn't work. That's the paraphrasing stuff because I'm paraphrasing for somebody else. And it's a peer of mine. So it's important. If I get this right, they're going to... I'm going to get some social capital about that. And I'm going to feel really good about myself because I understand it and I got some sort of confirmation. Lev Vygotsky calls this the zone of proximal development, where some students are here and some students are here. And the students that are here help the students here get this. And they can do this in a personal one-to-one -one way that you, as an instructor, cannot do for them because you have 300 other students that you have to watch for. So use groups. Use group projects. Use pair and share the idea of like, I'm going to talk to Dan, or Dan's going to see we're going to work on this problem together, they're going to think about something. You can do this stuff in Canvas very easily through groups. And you can set up groups automatically, you can set them up manually. Um, it's a great way to make your life easier and to help the students get to this pleasantly frustrating thing. And I've got examples again. 
how to use the different tools somewhere else, somewhere in here. All right. So let's think again um, individually and maybe talk to your neighbors. We just talked about how oh, that's a good thing. How do you do this in class? And if you talk to the people that are next to you, they will say some things and you'll be like, oh yeah, I do that too. So write down a couple of things that you already do. All right, let's uh, look at the left over here, table three. But what, what exactly is for sharing now? Um, any of the things that you guys already do that provides good problem spaces for our students to explore? Yeah, so we were talking about with uh, the idea of group projects, some of the pitfalls of that, and how you can uh, work around it. So the possibility of just doing having part of the grade or supplemental piece just be students grading each other's participation. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, we also were kind of exploring ideas for actually how students grade or do some type of kind of peer review assessment uh, level grading of each other as well. Great. Mm -hmm. We had an active teaching lab where Tim Boston came in and talked about um, group uh, peer review as well. And he talked about some of those things. That is in the e ATL e-journal, um, if you want to see his previews on that. But he came up with a sort of a rubric for having students assess each other um, in a way that was not, that's hard to do, isn't yes. it, right, for students? Because they don't want to, if it's anonymous, sometimes it'll be nasty. Mm -hmm. If it's not anonymous, then it's, it's all like, positive. good job, man, <laughs> <laughs> great, whatever. Um, but how do you find that medium space for that yeah. so that they, because you want to help them work together well and not just set them off to go cause chaos. <laughs> it's tricky. All right, what do you guys talk about? I like your, your idea the quiz solving together, solving your experience. Yeah, it's, a, it's based on team-based learning. Yep. It's a concept where people take most, most six quizzes individually, like maybe five multiple choice questions. Yep. And then right afterwards, they take the same five questions as a team. And it comes with scratch off multiple choice forms right. for the team part. And so everybody has to argue with one another and create discussion as to mm -hmm. how to, you know, why would they choose A and not B, and, you know? And so it works yep. very nicely. Great. And so they get immediate feedback if they scratch it off as a team. They find the star underneath the correct answer, and if they don't get the star, then that means that it was wrong, and they have to scratch again. So. Yep. Very <laughs> good. How about you guys? Tip two, or anything? We were shooting to me most of the time. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, the, one, one thing that came up with me, um, I teach. Uh, I teach linguistic pragmatics, and one of the things that we're concerned about is uh, some, uh, you know, so what, what we try to do is we, we, we get students to read stuff, and there's an awful lot of reading, because I'm in the English department, so there's an awful lot of reading. So the, the question is, how can we relate the reading of the scientific reading from the literature to something which is in people's lives? So, that's great. so mm -hmm. for example, in something like, you know, uh, one of the topics we look at is, is politeness, for example, politeness and impoliteness. And you know, so you read it, you read in the textbook what what uh, politeness and impoliteness is, and what examples are, and how how can you relate that to your own life? And what you do? It's great. So you're taking the problem space, and you're saying, what does that problem space look like in your life? And you could do that by saying, take some examples of maybe some Facebook posts or Snapchats or whatever. Hide the person's name. You know, be considerate of that, but then share that with the class. What does it, how does this show politeness or not politeness? So they're going into their own personal life and they're saying, how do my course concepts apply in this, right? And that makes, believe me, that makes it a lot more powerful for them because it's not just an academic concept, it's a personal concept then. It's applied to the personal concept. Um, oh, I had one other thing about problem spaces. Oh, Piazza. How many of you have used Piazza? Have you, how many of you know what Piazza is? All right. So Piazza is um, 
I love the, the backstory of Piazza. Piazza was created by an Indian engineer who was a female, and she noticed in India, in the caste system, um, women are not allowed to talk to men. And so she was in this, these engineering classes, and they would have these problems posed, and the men would all go, and they'd all talk with themselves and figure it out, and she'd sort of be over here because she couldn't talk to them, and she's like, well, this isn't fair. Like, they're working on this thing together, and I can't be part of that because my culture doesn't allow that. So she put together this program that lets people participate anonymously or um, as a, a, a named person. An instructor will pose a problem, a really difficult problem, that is above, it's up in this overwhelming part. And then the students have to work together, almost a wiki style, in a wiki style, and come up with an answer. So some student might be, I think it has something to do with this. Somebody else would be like, oh yeah, it's this part and this part over here. And eventually, with all the students, they craft this question or this answer. And some students can be like, I've got a dumb question, so I'm not going to use my name. Um, how do we know about this? And somebody else will be like, oh, I know the answer to that, so I'm going to use my name because I want to look smart <laughs> to my peers. Um, it's this. And here's the site uh, source for that. The instructor can come in at any point, or a TA can come in and say, you guys are on a wild goose chase. You're off the track. This area over here, you're on the right track over here. Um, and eventually they can come up with an answer, working together at this, and the instructor can be like, you got it. You guys work together and you got this really overwhelming problem. Well done. That's a problem space where the students are working with each other. It's not a lot of work for the instructor because the instructor doesn't have to sit by them and say, no, not that, yes, this, no, not that, look over here, because the students do that themselves. Piazza integrates with Canvas. Yeah. So realistically speaking, what's the maximum number of students you can have working on a problem with the um, Brian S. in organic chemistry uh, came to the active teaching lab and talked about using it in his course with 130 students. Um, I don't know what the maximum <laughs> number is, but you can imagine that it would get a, it could get messy there. Right. <laughs> um, but he also has all of the students use Piazza as, uh, instead of sending him emails, mm -hmm. he posts it on Piazza. And that way, if he answers a question, Maybe everybody sees it. Sees it. Mm. So un unless it's like, my mom died, then you know we send that email. But otherwise, mm. it's Where do you find Piazza? Is he part of Canvas? Piazza integrates with Canvas. Mm -hmm. How is it integrated with Canvas? It's one of the LTI tools. Yeah. That's about all um, there's a KB doc on it. It's trivial. You can find it. All right. Yeah. Question. Is there any? I have a book in the version. Is there a way to drag assessment? Is there a way to drag assessment from Piazza into Canvas? I believe there is not yet. I don't know if there will be. I imagine that there will be. Um, I know I put a link to the KB doc on this. That we'll talk about that. Um, so in the next hour uh, from 11 to 12, let's yeah. dig into that. I'll say, we don't have an answer. It's a great system. You can subscribe to get emails. The students post, I immediately get an email. I can click and respond right there. Um, you know, that's pinnable. Students can do it. Yeah. That supports a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so if you need to do math equations, that's one of the ones. Mm -hmm. Duncan, would you be interested in doing an uh, active teacher lab on Piazza Canvas <laughs> next year? Yes, there is. Well, Julie, you know what that? We got Duncan for active teacher. All right, good. Thank you. Useful, useful topic. Mm -hmm. I didn't know this story. I thought it was an invention by by uh, Michigan State of Michigan. She came to. Uh, she spoke at a Delta event about it. So she grew it. Yeah, well, I, don't, I, it may be that she saw that so culture. Use that experience. Yeah. Yeah. It's a spinoff from Michigan. It's a spinoff from Michigan. 
Yeah, it's a way to dig into that group space, yeah. Yeah, that problem space, and let the students do a lot of your work as an instructor, I think. Mm -hmm. um, problem spaces, one more thing about and going back to the universal design for learning, the multiple forms, multiple means of representation, different ways that I will present the material so that all my students can get to it, different ways of um, expression, multiple means of expression so that the students can express what they've learned, that they've met my learning objectives in different ways that are unique to them, and multiple means of engagement, how do I get them interested in, in the first place. This graphic is um, comes from a study by uh, Bartle, James Bartle, Richard Bartle. Um, he talked about video games and a multi, uh, massive multiplayer video games. And he talked about the four different types of players in these games. And I thought to myself, this is actually really significant in more than just video games. There are the people who want to play the game because they want to talk with other people. So they're the people that will come in and they just want to chat with you as you're having your adventures or doing whatever in these massive multiplayer games. There are the people who want to explore the world. They want to go check under every rock, find every hidden Easter egg there, you know, learn every different thing. They're in, they're in, in the game for the breadth of the game. There are the achievers. The achievers are the people who will take the test, uh, do that uh, level over and over and over again until they get the absolute top score because they want to have the fastest run through of the level. They want to have the most points, whatever. And then there are the killers. And the killers are in there to be jerks because they get um, thrills out of showing how they're unique and special and better and that kind of thing. They're all ego. So they will kill you when you're down and then when you get reborn again, they'll kill you again just because they can. <laughs> Do you recognize these people in your class? Yeah. Does your class give these people an outlet so that they don't disturb too much these people? Yeah. Is there a place where these people can talk but not overpower these yeah. people? Is there a balance between you know, do you let them do enough things so that they can go with whatever paths they need to go? Do you give them points? When you talk about gamification, oftentimes you only hear about this quadrant here. Let's give them points. People want points. Can they earn points for this? Let's gamify the course. Let's give them points. But they never talk about the other areas of gamification. And be able to pick up health. Right, health points, right. <laughs> So this fits in also with multiple means of representation, expression, engagement. In your course, can you give these different types of students? And there are probably more. There's a way to think about this with 16. You know, the lines are different, but the ideas are the same. Can I, can I ask a question about the definition of that? Absolutely. Speaking of gamification and games, and this might not be the right place for this, um, getting students off of their computers and phones and stuff like that. Are there some great rules for that and some great techniques? But that's another, that could be off the parking lot question. That, that is a whole, parking lot question. whole huge thing. Um, the short answer is direct them in using it. You know, they, use it. they have them, yeah. and so you say, all right, first one to do this or do that or whatever, it's this. Not a great answer, sorry. Um, Morton Gernsbacher in Psychology is just, I think she just published a paper on um, computer use in classes, and she looked, she, it's a meta-analysis, so she looks at all of these different um, The overall, she, there are hundreds of articles that she has looked at and, and, and cited. Um, and overall, it's better to have them. Yeah. I know there are people that are like, put them away, I don't want them in my classroom. And that's your right as, a, as an instructor to do that. Mm -hmm. But overall, it's better. Judy, Julie. Uh, you can also facilitate 
um, interactive discussions and you can, depending on what you want to facilitate or how much effort you want to put in, you can do like jigsaw discussions. You can bring in like paper forms where each student receives sort of a piece of maybe a research article and it's their job to then communicate to the rest of their small group what they learned in their section of it. And then they have to report what everyone else has reported um, so that they have to be engaged. And there's no way that, I mean, if, if, you, if you want to do something like that, you could facilitate a discussion. And that way they have to use this to find out their own information mm -hmm. that, that helps them tackle that. Yes. So we had a question. So we talked a lot about Canvas. Like the, it seems like the premise is that they're using it outside of the classroom. Yes. So what can you use it for assembly in the classroom? Yes, you can. Have um, people done that? I, it's not used very often because we are still not at the point where enough people have, well, they all have these things, but the Canvas app for this is, is that good? it's pretty bad. Mm. Yeah. So um, I would encourage you to use top. So you've heard of clickers before? Top hat is a form of clickers. Oh, okay. Are you tell us about top hat? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I like the tagline here. Top left. Oh. Where is it? Empowers professors by turning <laughs> distracting mobile devices into learning tools and building comprehension with customizable, affordable textbooks and interactive homework. But yeah, one of the simple ways of doing this is I just gave a lecture, I asked a question. Did you get it? Knowledge check. They pull out their distracting mobile device and they answer the question. It might be a multiple choice question. It might be a short answer question. You can do heat maps on there. So identify the shoes in here, in this image. Or where are the Where are the outliers? Where are the outliers? Yeah. Where right. Where is the mistake in this derivation? And then they will see that image on their phone and they'll be like, I'm going to click right here on this shoe. That image comes up there now, and we got 33 people. There are 33 dots on here, or in this general area, and then one over here, and I'm like, uh oh, that one's mine. Everybody else thinks it's this part, and I think it's this part. What am I doing wrong? How am I not getting this? And so it's a way to sort of understand and gauge where am I versus everyone else. That's a great way of using the mobile devices. Last. So it seems like a lot of this is getting back to the, the, the foundation or the issues underlying why people try to just flip classroom piece. Yep. Um, so I'm wondering, like, is there kind of a, you know, if you don't want to go full on you know, recording all the lectures, do you have anything structured for kind of mini tools, mini guys to sort of flip? Mini flip? Um, <laughs> interactive lectures yeah, online is what you're sort of asking about. Well, just in general, like more for how you, if you don't want to pull on one semester to record all of your lectures and right. have all these design activities in the classroom, because obviously when you have those, just being forced to be more active in the classroom helps with a lot of the distraction issues. Yes, it does. So I guess I'm asking for, I mean, you're kind of talking about it already, but more, Package tricks for semi flipping. Yep. How to, how to have more active classrooms. I mean, we Top Hat, by the way, is integrated with Canvas as of this summer. It'll be, right now, once we only had one license for the campus and it was with the desire to learn. Now that everybody's moving to Canvas, they're like, 
All right, we're, we're on campus now. So it was available for Desire to Learn classes in the past. In fall, it'll be available for Canvas classes, but not Desire to Learn. So if you're using clickers already and you're not in Canvas, now it's time to move. Sorry. I was just going to say, we, we typically do, um, well, our instructors will go to, in the Health Science Learning Center, we'll go there and do to 10 to 15 minute video, um, like a lecture that we're going to do. Have them watch that the night before and then make it more interactive in the class that way. It's more work for them. Yeah. Like, they don't want to watch an hour long and then come back in for an hour class, but they do a short segment and make that discussion the next morning. That's even more kind of well for us. Yeah. yeah. So how do students sign up for a top five and how expensive is it? Um, for the university, the university has negotiated a deal for the students. It's like 58 bucks for their life here at the university. Wait, the students years. have to pay yeah. to use this? The students have to pay to use this. Oh, well, so instead of getting in a textbook, <laughs> instead of making them use a textbook, make them buy a top hat. How, how, how are those interchangeable? How is a textbook versus top hat interchangeable? Yeah. A top hat, I think, would argue, I would argue that top hat is so much more useful for your learning than a yeah. textbook would be. OK, maybe I don't understand what top hat is then. I thought it was like a surveying active involvement tool. Yeah, so instead of the questions at the end of the book where you can like maybe look up the answers on the end of the, at the end of the book, at the end of the chapter, um, you get to do this in class. You get to ask questions, you get to check your knowledge and get instant and Sure, but feedback. does Top Hat have content in it now? Because that's what I use books for, is yeah. content. Content? Questions. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you have to get your own content. You can save it. You can save it. Okay. Broadcast it to the devices. Okay. Mark it up. Yeah, sure. See, that's the part I didn't know. So you can feed content into it. Yes. So you're all content. Yeah, but is want, there copyright issues? Yeah, it's yeah. so quick that you use books. All about you. I do. I've done a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you deal with uh, copyrighted copyright material? material? Like the textbook that yeah. you're considering using? The same way that material. you would put copyrighted material you up on yes. your um, in your course site, oh, oh, as yeah. readings and articles and stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is not public. Right. If you put stuff on your course site, it's not in the public. It's just open to your students. And it works with the gradebook. So these in-class quizzes that you have can go directly into the gradebook, and that can be a source of a social peer-to-peer -peer learning, um, low-stakes group assessment. All right, are we ready for systems? This is the last part. Systems thinking. Um, when we're in these problem spaces, if we're really exploring them, we're going to hit the edges of them, right? And we're going to break them. And then our strategies will fail. And then we'll be like, oh, this doesn't work anymore. What's wrong? It's what, because we hit the edge of the system. And hitting the edges of the system is what helps us understand the borders of a problem system. It's how we learn. Uh, one of the great ways that I love about, uh, the great ways that I love to do to learn systems is to break them. If you've ever had um, young boys, you'll know that a lot of things in your house might be explored. Girls those, too. Girls too, those problem spaces, thank you. Um, those problem spaces were explored and broken. And that's how they understood it. Um, that can be expensive if you have um, not sandboxy type systems. But if the more sandboxy, the more simulation, that kind of thing, the easier it is to, to make those, um, to learn those systems. So can we do that in our classes as well? Can we do that in groups so that we see the different parts of the system that I might not think of go to, but that Keith might think to go to, and so together we're going to go see that part, and so I'll learn that part that he sees that I don't see. And then the meaning of act, of, um, the meaning as action or image. I guess I talked about that. That failure. Are there spaces for failure that don't totally wipe us out? Can we explore? Have low stakes failure? And again, video games are great with this because when you die in a video game, you start all over again. And you can do that over and over and over again. 
So it's kind of a fun way to do that. So how do we do that already? Is the next question. The easy answer for this is we give tests, we give quizzes, we explore, that's a big part of it. We ask them to write papers. Um, we ask them to work on problems together. I know in the nursing uh, active learning classroom, they all have these whiteboards and they work together in groups and do mind mapping sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, what different ways can we do that? Um, in Canvas, more in our classrooms, more in our online spaces. Any thoughts? Mm -hmm. I like dystopias. <laughs> uh, instead of a problem to save the world, you have a problem to destroy the world. Oh, okay. oh. You have a problem to break the system. Roles are a really good way to do this. In a reading group, I'll do a reading response, um, give an opinion piece for them to read. Somebody has to be the author advocate. So four people in a group, one of them has to take the role of whatever the author says, I agree. And here are two more pieces of information that I bring into it. One of them is the devil's advocate. Whatever the author says, whether I agree or not, my role is to disagree with that person and to bring two more pieces of evidence to disagree with that. Again, find those edges. Third role, mediator. So why can't we all get along? Author advocate has some good points. Author devil's advocate has some good points. Here's a third way to do this. And then the fourth role is my favorite, the troll. The internet troll. That's a dumb point. That's stupid. Um, their job is to just be a troll. It's kind of the week off. So the next week, everybody switches, and you get to try a different role. Mm -hmm. By having the troll in there, I like to encourage this idea that we can have academic discourse. We can choose to disagree. Um, if you've ever gotten a, a journal article reviewed and rejected, um, or a peer review for a conference paper, you may have seen some of these trolls that you encounter in academic life. Um, getting used to it as part of life without being like, oh, I'm worthless, or ah, oh, that person's terrible. Well, not really, they're just playing a role. It's their job. Nobody thinks Barb's terrible just because she's a troll this week. We all understand that it's her job this week to be a troll. This would be a way to do that, to have different, assign different students to play, to find these different edges of the system and explore that space. It gives the killers an outlet. Yep. <laughs> Go back to Legos. The more that we fail with them, the more that we understand what are the systems that run it. All right, and then multiple means of rec representation, multiple means of expression. Can we give them multiple ways to do this? This is my favorite thing. It's a student group. Um, in bio 151, instead of doing the regular tutorials and having the instructor give them tutorials, they had the students create these tutorials in groups of five. They had to run it past the instructor to make sure that it was accurate. They all brought in their own specific parts of their life. Like this is this guy's dormitory. This guy with that music is a composer, and he talked to the composer of. What was that movie, the one of the dream inside the dream inside the dream? They contacted that guy and said, can I use a song? So they brought their part of the life into it. This guy's had Legos. So they brought that in. And these guys, I don't know what they did. They, they, uh, they've got some really cool, uh, stopping the art to start here in just a second. But they all work together and they explore these problem spaces. They created the different forms of engagement because they were able to bring the things that they like to do into it. They represented it in different ways. Um, and they were able to express this. This one 
probably wouldn't be the mass murderer type person or person to hire that. Exactly. Probably wouldn't happen again anymore, but this is 2010 before that was as big of a deal. Alright. That's all I've got for you, really, with this um, today.